to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, it's, yeah, why don't we call the meeting to order at 634. Um, we're going to do a little presentation to talk about the bond vote and what all the projects that we're proposing, um, what they're for and what what's the impact that it'll have on uh, taxpayers. And, and um, so I'll, I'll be doing that presentation in a little bit. Before we do that, um, why don't we do introductions? I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the chair of the school board um, from South Royalton. And yeah. Eric Lafayette with EEI helped develop the project. I'm Phil Laflam. I'm the middle school principal here. Uh, heavily interested in the project we, we are proposing at our campus here. I'm Nancy Cajunley. I'm on the board from Bethel. Jamie Canary, superintendent of schools. Andrew Bowen, elementary principal. I'm William Brooks. I teach shop at the high school. And last year I taught here. I'm Dana Kolovec. I'm a former board member and a resident of Bethel. Mm -hmm. Deatry Feeney, here in Bethel. And I was on the school board many years ago. Mm -hmm. Yuri Pavoni, resident of Bethel. Ellie Griffin, chair of the Recreation Committee. Rick Hughes, former board member from Bethel. Reminiscing how Dana and I had actually been fried in this room in the past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once or twice. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again for everybody for coming out. Um, as I said, we'll do a little presentation to talk about what's in the bond, and, um, and then we'll take some questions and after that we'll walk down to the entrance and, and look at what we're going to be changing and, and how things will, you know, try and give a little visualization of how things will be different um, on this campus. Um, when we do our South Road board meeting in a week, informational meeting, we'll do the same thing there to look at the current uh, music spaces and, um, you know, the space that the other uh, proposed projects will be going into. So, all right. Um, so the slideshow will be up on the screen over here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So uh, we're here to talk about the White River Valley Schools Building Projects Bond Vote. Um, is there any way to make that full screen, the um, slideshow? Probably not. Okay. Anyway. I think you can turn it. There we go. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're asking your for your support to make uh, critical building improvements for um, to address needs that we've identified um, that uh, we have need to address. Um, the total project will cost uh, $6.8 million, and we're asking for $3.8 million of bond vote up to 3.8. Might not end up being quite that much, but um, up to $3.8 million of bond funds to help pay for that. We have um, fundraising and grants and um, building reserve funds to pay for uh, the rest of it. Um, as far as what this will mean for the average taxpayer, um, it would be less than $50 of an annual, average annual cost for an average um, homeowner in our towns. Average homeowners, about $200,000 uh, house is about average for both of our towns. So um, that's what the cost would be for that average homeowner. For somebody who's a low income, um, who has that same $200,000 house, uh, somebody earning $40,000 or less, would the price would be even lower where it's less than $20 a year on average. So that's the bottom line of kind of what it would cost for an average taxpayer. So we are proposing these projects to <coughs> help address school safety um, through secure entrances and also improving our ventilation um, and uh, providing larger spaces to meet fire codes. Um, it would enhance our ability to provide learning for our students through the shop expansion and um, expanding our music programs. And um, this would also be a benefit for our community members. Um, these schools are, are the heart of our community um, and investing in them provides benefits for everybody. Um, all right, 
context. So one of the things that comes up is why should we be doing this now? Um, like we've had our schools, both campuses have been around for quite a while and we've had kids in them for a long time, so why <coughs> do we have these needs now? Uh, for one thing, our enrollment is up. Uh, our South Royal High School, before we merged, the, the peak enrollment um, back when there were a lot more students in our schools, uh, the high school peaked at 208 students. With Bethel and Royalton combined now, um, and the fact that we're drawing in more students from surrounding schools than we have in the past, um, our, this year our enrollment is uh, 231, so our current enrollment is 10% higher. We have 10% more high school students in our, in our building than we have ever in the past. And while the, mer during the merger we have our middle school, the South Royal Middle School kids came here, which freed up extra classroom space for the high, uh, the high school students that were coming in. You know, there's dedicated function rooms that are the same size they were before the merger. So, you know, we didn't gain extra space in those dedicated function rooms. So those are, are getting to be crowded. Um, the other part is, you know, we've identified some safety issues. And I think everybody realizes and acknowledges that kind of the safety concerns for schools are a lot different than they have been in the past. And we need to adjust our buildings to meet kind of the current standards for, for what um, is needed for our current environment for schools. Um, and we also have a lot more knowledge about how important ventilation is for keeping um, kids healthy. Um, so that's another thing that really kind of became apparent in the last few years. Um, and now that we know about these safety issues, we really should address them uh, as soon as we can. This is also an investment for our future um, of our schools. So if when we invest in our schools, it shows other communities that we care about our education and our students. And it makes our schools more um, appealing for them to send their children to. So by investing in our schools, it also helps bring in more kids from the surrounding communities, and that brings in money that helps us lower our tax rates and provide more services for our students. So. Um, and finally, we do have some um, regulations that, this is for the stormwater regulations, that we need to uh, do some of the work to, um, that needs to happen in the very near future. Um, by combining all these projects together, we can do them in a way that saves money. If we tried to do some of these separately, it would mean duplicating some work, and so if we do them all together, we're able to save some money. So that's why we're proposing to do all these, and we're asking for your help to do that. <coughs> so now we'll go through and look at each aspect of the, the project and talk about you know, why we, why, what's deficient in our current buildings and what um, we're proposing to do about it. Um, these secure entrances and the Bethel campus um, the particularly the middle school entrance and the Royalton rear campus rear entrance um, don't meet recommended school safety standards. Um, so the ideal school safety rec standard recommendations is to have a secure vestibule access where you can buzz visitors into a space in the school where they don't have access to the whole rest of the school. And then they can be vetted by um, the office staff and if everything checks out, then they're allowed entrance into the rest of the school. Right now, um, and both Royalton, then the rear entrance, which is primarily you know, the entrance used by high schoolers who drive themselves and also visitors who park in that back lot, um, there's no visibility <coughs> for the office to that back entrance. Um, and, and the middle school here, there's just a single set of doors, so once you're in the building, you're in the building and you have access to the whole um, facility, which again is not what the recommended school safety standards uh, prescribe. Um, with the rear entrance on the Royalton building, that's also the primary, like, that's the entrance you use when you're going to 
basketball games that happen in the elementary gym. It's the entrance you use when you're going to any of the concerts that happen on the stage on that campus. So many of the people from surrounding communities, that's going to be the entrance that they associate with our school. Um, that's going to be where they go in when they're coming to see a concert or a drama production, and it's going to be where they go when they're coming for recreational basketball um, games. So that entrance is, is not very welcoming. It's, it's just a single door and a brick wall, and it does not show our schools off to the you know, greatest extent. And for when we're looking to a, appeal to other communities and, and kind of make our school a destination that they would want to come to, we want to make that something that when, when we're having people come into our buildings, we want it to be someplace they would want to go to. So um, we're talking about doing um, making secure vestibule entrances for the White River Valley Middle School and White River Valley High School entrances. Uh, these would include video cameras and remote locks on the doors so that, um, uh, particularly for the White River Valley High School rear entrance, there, the central office could see people who are arriving on the video camera and buzz them in that way. For the middle school, there would be a vestibule um, that they would be, visitors would come into that they could check into a, a check-in window to check in with the office staff, and then the office staff could allow them access to the rest of the building. But with the remote buzz-ins, you know, they wouldn't have to be getting up to allow people into the um, building, so it'd be less disruptive for them. Um, there would also be, on the White River Valley High School entrance, we would be adding a new lobby for visitors who come in to our building, and uh, there would be two extra bathrooms, which would really help for when we do have large crowds coming in for um, performances or drama productions. The cost of this would be um, it would be six, about six hundred and twenty-six thousand, I think, for the Bethel entrances and seven hundred and twenty thousand for the Royalton entrances. Um, so the total cost for the secure entrances would be 1.368 million. We have applied for up to $600,000 in grant funds to help pay for that, and we'll now be finding out about those in this upcoming March, um, how much of that funding we have received. So um, go to the next slide. This is what the uh, rendering of the rear entrance for the, um, the high school entrance would look like. Um, and you can see that that's a much more welcoming and, and attractive um, for people visiting our, our school. Go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're, we have a rendering of the um, middle school entrance here, we just didn't get it, um, you know, haven't been able to get it into the slideshow yet, so we're just gonna pause the slideshow to take a look at what that rendering would look like. Just a second. All right, why don't you, could you scroll that down just a little bit? So this is what the rendering of the middle school entrance would look like. So the, what would be happening there is that where the doors currently are would stay as the interior doors, and there would be a new um, vestibule that would be created by putting doors on the outside of that. Um, and yeah, later we can walk down and, and hopefully get a better visualization of what exactly that would look like. So this is just the floor plans of those two new entrances. So there's the middle school entrance floor plan on the left there that shows the 
um, the bottom side, of the bottom two doors that are in the plan there are the existing doors, and the ones that are above that would be the new, new wall that's put in. And um, so you come into that entrance there, and then there'd be a window on the right that you can check into the, uh, to the, um, with the office staff. And on the right side there is the high school entrance, um, which would have a square vestibule as well with the video cameras. And then you'd come into a lobby, which would be a nice space for um, during performances for people to be able to, you know, like the boosters to set up their table for with the big goods that they're selling or, you know, whatever other things. And also be, it's also a common place that the high schoolers wait while they're waiting for rides or for um, you know, their next um, after school activity. So providing a nice space for them to do that it would be a benefit as well. It does include two new ADA accessible bathrooms as well. That's also where the high school students leave to get on the bus. Right. <clears throat> Um, the Bethel Elementary entrance would maintain the same layout, but there would be new hardware um, provided for that, and, and it would um, the way it's being used would be changed a little bit to um, you know work on the safety of that <coughs> entrance. Okay, next, uh, next slide. So one of the um, spaces that is having uh, space, cons you know, space constraints, um, given the number of students in our school and the demands for services, is our um, shop. Um, Rodney, did you want to say something? <coughs> I think we got muted. Oh, that's not good. How long have we been muted? A few minutes, I think. Two minutes, okay. Um, I'll just start over on this slide, I guess. Yeah. So um, one of the spaces that is facing space constraints with the extra, uh, the added students and the increased demand is, is our, <coughs> our shop area. Um, there's been an increased demand for tech ed classes um, and our high school shop is, is too small at this point for the amount of demand that there is. Um, with flexible pathways, um, that's a way that students can do independent projects to explore learning in different um, ways, and that frequently can involve hands-on learning. And um, between that and the shop classes, being able to accommodate larger student projects would be a real benefit for our students, and right now it's a difficult um, to do in the limited space the shop has. Um, in addition, the welding station is, is in, a, in a corner where it can only really be accessed and usable by one student at a time. And so, you know, we'd like to be able to increase the capacity of that, um, that as well. So uh, the proposal is to add a 1,000 foot, square foot addition um, off the end of the existing shop that would provide more space for workstations and space for additional equipment um, and help um, you know, provide the space that uh, the students who want, you know, allow us to accommodate the students who would like to access this program. Um, you know, one thing that comes up sometimes is, is people ask you know, about the fact that we're expanding our shop when there's the um, tech center in Randolph as an option or in Hartford. But when you, in order to do those programs, you have to commit to going on a bus to the tech center and being there for the full school day. And that takes students out of our school and sends them to um, Randolph. And you know that's a great option for many, but for students that would like kind of the traditional high school education, but want to be able to access um, and learn shop skills or tech ed skills, um, 
being able to accommodate them on our campus is, is a good thing to be able to do. So um, this expansion, um, the estimate cost for the cost is $350,000 for that. Next. Um, and the other main part of our um, building that is, is running into space constraints is our music department. Uh, the current music room is too small, particularly for band um, rehearsals where we have, um, you know, we're putting a lot of performers into a small space uh, and the room um, becomes very crowded because we also have to accommodate all of the uh, musicians plus the music stands and, and the you know, percussion instruments and everything else and it becomes very crowded. It also is very noisy. The room does not have very high ceilings and there's not acoustic treatments. And so um, band practice regularly um, has regularly been measured at 110 decibels, which uh, exceeds the WHO's safe listening levels. Um, so, you know, that's not something that we want to be exposing our students to on a regular basis. basis. <coughs> it's also very disruptive. Um, having the music room with that loud music, um, you know, in the middle of a school day with the surround, uh, other spaces that are in use surrounding it. So we have um, alternative classroom down there, which provides programming for um, students that are learning how to better, um, you know, regulate in a regular classroom and that's right next to the music room so when it's um, music band practice is going on that could be disruptive for them and we also have you know occupational therapy um, and um, counseling offices down there and again that's difficult to do while band practice is going on um, it's also a uh, shared space with the elementary music program. And so that makes it difficult for both the elementary music and the high school music department. It limits the amount of time that the um, room is available for the high school, which makes it so that you know, they have to limit the offerings they're able to offer. And it also limits the amount of time it's available for the elementary school, which means that um, half of the elementary music classes wind up being taught in the classroom. That's difficult as, you know, it has to be a mobile music program, which means whatever instruments or other things have to be brought in in a cart. And um, it makes it so that the teachers can't use their room for planning purposes when music class is going on. So those schedule conflicts, you know, harm both the high school and the elementary school. Um, and it's also in an inconvenient location. So the music room is in the basement on the far side of the campus, uh, the South Rowan building from the um, stage where performance, performances um, happen. So anytime that the high school wants to put, band wants to put on a performance, they have to bring all of the uh, music stands and instruments and you know some of these like timpanis are, are large instruments that have to be brought all the way from one end of the school to the other involving going upstairs and so it's you know there's a lot of time that winds up getting spent on that that could be better spent with learning um, and so the other reason why it's needed is is music education and music participation has been shown many times to sh boost test scores and grades in math, English, and science. So by investing in our music department and our music programming and trying to encourage more students to take part in it, we can also support uh, the rest of our academic um, departments. Uh, so that's, you know, it's a benefit all around. Yes, ask a question here? Because I'm not familiar with this. Um, I'm only familiar with where the gym is and stuff in the South Royalton building. So, you, so the new performing arts wing, since we're already on this slide, is that being built wherever the state, near wherever the stage is? Yeah, so that'll be on the next slide. Okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 
why don't we go to the next slide? So yeah, so what we're proposing, um, and I'll come over here. so the existing stage is here, and this is the existing elementary gym. So this is the exterior of the existing building. So this would be putting in practice room, uh, a large practice room next to the existing gym, and um, and provide a, a really roomy and, and nice space for them to to have for practices and maybe even for small performances as well. Um, it could be used for that as well. Uh, there would be an office space for the music department and it would also have soundproof practice rooms. Um, we have a really great um, lesson program that we provide um, for our students that allows every student, regardless of financial ability, access to really high quality um, lessons, instrument lessons. And so these individual practice rooms would, they're soundproof and would really help give space for those lessons to happen without disrupting other things that are happening in our buildings. You know, this being on the opposite side of the elementary gym really isolates the ensemble rehearsal space from any other um, any other uh, you know classroom spaces that might be that have be affected by the noise of of rehearsal um, and as you see it's right next to the stage and there would be um, direct lift access from the rehearsal space into the onto the stage area um, for moving heavy equipment and other things. Um, so that would make, uh, make it a much more convenient space for that as well. So, you know, we really think that this would really be a great resource for our music department and make, um, make it a much more pleasant, ex or not just pleasant, but uh, enriching and rewarding experience for our music students. Um, and, you know, as we talked about before, you know, we want to make our school a place that people want to come. And, you know, in a recent survey of students, 30% of the tuition students that we have in our building now say that the music program was important for their choice of our school. So really doubling down on that strength will hopefully, you know, continue to make our, our um, school at attractive choice. Next one. Um, so this is a rendering of what it would look from the, like from the outside. Um, and, you know, it, it's also going to enhance the appeal of our building from, you know, as you drive by on the street, it makes it a very attractive, um, you know, building from both the entrance on the on the back side, but also the, the view from the street as you're going by. So this is what we will see. Where the the announcement board is now, it'll be right along there facing the road. Right, so this would be coming, uh, driving towards the village mm -hmm. from um, along past the school. So the announcement board would be on the far side there. Mm -hmm. And you can see the rear entrance that we were looking at rendering that we were looking at before is on the right side of the building. Okay. So um, that addresses the issues that we have with our rehearsal space for the music <coughs> space. Um, in addition to that, the performance space that we have is needs some work as well. You know, we've been getting by using the elementary school gym, but it's really not an ideal space for um, for holding performances. We are one of the largest schools that doesn't have a dedicated um, auditorium in Vermont, and while th we wouldn't be able to fix that issue, you know, I think building an auditorium would be significantly more expensive and require a lot more space. Um, there's a lot we can do that can make our, our stage and performance area uh, better for uh, both uh, the performers and our audiences. So um, 
one of the big issues with our current stage is it's not accessible. There's no handicap accessible lift or ramp access to it. So, you know, our mobility challenged students aren't able to um, be involved with um, our, you know, on the stage. So, and it also being a gym, our current performance space has very poor acoustics. It's very echoey and, um, you know, really wasn't designed with uh, performances in mind. And a lot of the equipment is outdated and um, we also don't have some of the audio equipment. So we're currently, anytime we have a performance, we're renting the sound system and microphones in order to do that. So in addition to the um, performing arts wing addition, we'd be looking at doing upgrades to our stage and our gym. Um, we'd be doing lighting and audio system upgrades to better enable our, um, our student performers to shine in their performances. Um, this would also make it so that we don't have to rent um, audio equipment every time that we want to put on a concert, which will save money in the budget. There will be wallboard installation to approve the gym and acoustics, which will um, help, you know, make it a better place for the audience to, to appreciate our performers. And there will be an elevator lift for wheelchair access to the stage. Um, <clears throat> In addition, there would be ventilation, additional ventilation provided um, and, and heat pump heating provided for the space as well, which will make it a more comfortable place for large crowds to be in. Um, so this should make it a better experience for school concerts and drama productions, but also that's where South Rome holds our town meetings. So um, that will be a benefit for that. And also, you know, Rec basketball that's happening in there. I can speak from experience that some of those games can get very loud and having some acoustic treatment in there would be a benefit for that as well. Um, so those, that portion of the project would cost uh, $350,000. So this video is, um, talks about uh, the performing arts side of things. So the uh, performing Arts Wing and the gym stage upgrades and um, looks at the need for that. And it starts out with Dick Ellis talking about um, starting up the band program. So go ahead. When I came back to Vermont, the local high schools, None of them had bands. I decided we had to have bands. So I did. I started bands in four of the towns in this area. South Rose and First, and then uh, Randolph, and Bethel, and Rochester. It started with Dick Ellis as a proponent of music. Uh, he taught in all of the schools in the district probably at that time and he led the town band and I saw at that time even before my children were in school that here was a community that embraced music to have like such a supportive music program has like helped a lot of people like gain access to be able to do what they wanted to I play the trombone I'm in concert band jazz band chorus band jazz band normal band and theater. Music's always been a big part of my life, and I've been in band and chorus for as long as it's been available. I've been going to concerts at South Royalton since probably 1979, 80, something like that. But as an audience member, it is really hard to keep things under control because there is so much noise reverberating in the room. If our students can have a space that has good acoustics and can understand for themselves what they are producing, that makes a better musician. When I go down to like the band room, like and I see like like the band class, like and I see how many kids there are in there, it's so like it's so like confined 
that, but there's so many kids that want to join band. Our music program is growing and we just need a larger rehearsal space for these students. It's, it's pretty chaotic, to be honest. Um, so probably about 10% of class is spent just setting up and breaking down. If, if the setup was there already, students didn't have to do that, that could be a lot more time that students could be accessing their education. We spend all these months like playing this music in the basement room, and the acoustics in there, it's like too much to be playing. Not to mention the fact that we have like damaging amounts of sound hitting our ears when we're trying to rehearse down there. There is very little room to walk around. It's a hazard if there's an emergency. Anybody can walk into the band rehearsal on any day that band is rehearsing and see that it is at max capacity. Well, the Performing Arts Center would be such a great addition, especially to our music department in general. Just, I mean, what we have to do now is, in order to get to a concert, we have to lug all of our instruments, all the percussion, all, everything up the stairs into the small gym, which is basically on the other side of the school than the current band room we're in. I don't think students feel like it's a space where they're being celebrated. I think it's a space that we are making do, <laughs> but I don't think they are walking out and getting the musical experience that they deserve. 25% of our students are involved in the music program here at White River Valley High School. You know, when they built the new gym years ago, there was a lot of pride in our school and athletics, and, you know, the gym came, and like the saying is, if you build it, they will come. And I think it's true. When we talk about pride in our school, you know, pride is a sense of belonging. And I think it's important that everyone has that sense of belonging in our school. Providing the Performing Arts Center will be a chance for a lot of our students to have that sense of belonging and more pride in our school. There, there was a, um, a good buzz um, with the, the new Wildcat, a combination of two schools coming together as one. Um, and out of the gate, the, you know, academics has been a very large focus of that. Uh, we've most recently seen athletics be um, a big focus, and now, and now the piece that we're looking um, at this point to complete that package is the, the performing arts piece of it. The kids with school choice, they they get to look around, they get to see which schools they want to come to. With a performing arts center, we're gonna our school's gonna look a lot nicer, first of all, and already uh, the music department and the theater department such a massive draw. You know, we kicked around some numbers. If we just had eight to ten new students that came to our school every year that just wanted to participate in the performing arts piece, that that would pay a bond vote. When we're in a rehearsal and we've been working on something and something just comes together in a way that is really powerful, that they can feel it, I can feel it, there's, there's the sense in the room that something just happened. Look what they can produce together and that blended sound is the community of your singers, the community of your instrumentalists and band and orchestra, whatever it is. I want that for all students. That is my goal, is to make sure that there's music in everybody's life. And I think that the kids embrace that. And even though we're the ones like talking about this right now, and we're, we're here, I guarantee you if you go and ask anybody else who's part of these programs, part of the band or chorus or theater program, they're gonna agree and they're gonna say that how useful and helpful the tool of the PAC would be. I've always thought that uh, saying that success breeds success is quite true because uh, with that, we've somehow got a reputation of being a, a fairly good band. All right, so um, yeah, so that was the pouring arts part of the project. Um, that um, why don't you just go back two slides real quick. So the total cost for the performing arts side and the stage upgrades, um, go back one more. Um, sorry, one more. <laughs> so for the performing arts wing, it's uh, 3391000 um, And the music boosters have uh, set a $1.3 million fundraising goal. So the goal with this project was to fund, uh, have a one-third fundraise funded <coughs> Um, use one third of our reserve funds and then one third 
for the bond vote. Um, so, uh, you know, we can look later, but um, yeah, so anyway, let's move on to the next section. So um, this part of the project would be ventilation upgrades for the um, South Rowland Campus Library and Science Rooms. So both those rooms do not have active ventilation right now. And um, air quality is, is really important. And it's been shown that improving air, school air quality um, boosts student performance, reduces absenteeism, and enhances teacher and staff well-being. So um, you know, in places where we have large groups of students that can gather, like the library, having that active ventilation to really provide healthy, clean air for our students is important. Um, so we'd be adding active ventilation for those rooms. It would also include heat pump, heating and cooling to provide dehumidification, which would really help when it's getting close to uh, summertime and those rooms get pretty warm. Um, and there'd be an energy recovery unit added to the system to maximize the efficiency. <coughs> the um, adding active ventilation would increase our energy costs, but that would be offset by the savings from the heat pump, so there would be no added cost for running um, this additional ventilation. And that part of the project would cost uh, $350,000. Um, we're also looking to do a heating upgrade for the South Rowland campus. Uh, the oil tank on that uh, campus is reaching the end of life, and the location of the oil tank blocks the shop expansion that we would like to do. Um, it, currently, the South Rowland campus is burning number two fuel oil, which is more expensive and less efficient than other options, and um, what we'd like to move on from that. The current boiler has 10 years of life left, so we don't want to replace that. It wouldn't be cost effective to replace it entirely. So what we're proposing is to um, convert from number two fuel oil to propane. That would involve removing the existing underground oil tank and replacing it with uh, five 1,000 gallon propane tanks so it moved away from the um, immediate vicinity of the school. Um, and uh, this would enable us to switch from number two fuel to propane. And there would also be um, optimization done on the heating and ventilation controls, um, which would increase energy savings as well. So between the two of those, it's estimated that we would produce 30% less CO2 emissions on the Royalton campus, and that it would save an estimated of $13,000 a year in heating costs. Um, to do the conversion would cost $327,000 and $500. And finally, um, we need to do some stormwater abatement on the Royalton campus. Uh, the Royalton campus gym addition did not provide adequate stormwater abatement, and that was just discovered a few years ago. Um, we were given a, a grace period um, to come up with a plan to comply with the regulations, and we need to do that by the end of 2025. So there would be a drainage swale and catch area for storm runoff that we would be adding that would ensure compliance with regulations for both the gym edition and the proposed edition. Um, so looking at the project cost, uh, we've kind of talked about the individual cost of each part, but um, we the total cost would be $6.8 million, and the bond would be $3.8 million of that. We currently have $2.2 million in our capital fund. Um, we are looking to use uh, $1.7 million from that, which would leave us with uh, around $500,000 for use for emergency repairs and things like that, and help us avoid having to increase taxes if some unexpected expense comes up. Um, there's also the fundraising and grants that um, would also provide additional funds, and then the, we're looking to fund the remaining um, parts of the project with the bond um, money. Um, if you know we're able to either, so the total amount of the fundraising goal, the grant money, and the capital funds, and the bond money is actually more than what would be needed for the total project cost. So if we receive all of the grant funding and all the fundraising, um, then we'd be able to lower the amount 
that we actually wind up going to bond for. When we vote for the bond, we're, the voters are authorizing us to borrow up to that amount of money, but you know, depending on what the final bids come in and final uh, grants and fundraising, that um, amount may be different. But um, yeah. So as far as what this means for taxpayers, um, again, we project that this project will cost the average homeowner less than $50 a year on average. So um, it's going to vary over the time of the loan. It's a 20-year loan, and the first two years are interest-only payments, followed by 20 years of principal and interest payments. So when we're just doing interest-only payments, it's going to be a little, it's going to be less. And then when the principal payments first start, that's when it's going to cost the most, and then it decreases over time as we go on. Um, so the fifty dollars per year is the average cost that you, one would see on the tax bill over the life of the loan. Um, and again, that's for a $200,000 home if you're not receiving any sort of um, income assistance. Um, for lower income homeowners, um, there is the Vermont Property Tax Credit, which provides uh, relief for um, for property tax payments. And so for somebody earning less than $40,000 a year, it would be less than $20 a year on average. And um, that comes out as a percentage of your income. So um, it would be even less if, if income is less. Um, and these estimates are based on you know, not like we we did not include adding additional tuition students in those estimates. If we were able to attract additional tuition students as a result of this project, that would lower the cost further. So if we <coughs> um, each tuition student is, is about twenty thousand dollars, and if we were able to get one extra per year um, over the lifetime of the. Uh, bond that would make the cost an average $29 per year. If we're able to get two extra per year, which again is fairly modest, the cost becomes $11 per year. So it's really not an expensive project for our um, taxpayers and it really provides a lot of benefits um, at an affordable cost. You know, we're, I don't think there's any way to guarantee what that this will attract additional students, but I think, you know, it is reasonable to assume that it would attract some, but you know we provide the estimates without them, so that you can see even if we don't attract any, it's still very reasonable cost. Um, for the project timeline, uh, we're currently doing our informational meeting on the October 24th. There'll be another informational meeting on the Royalton campus. Um, on October 30th at 7 p.m. And then November 5th is the bond vote date. Uh, on December 5th, uh, if the vote is approved, then on um, December 5th we would sign a contract with the EEI um, for them to proceed with the work and they would go out for bid and, um, and get the individual contractors who would be doing the work. Um, February 1st, it would be finalizing the bid packages, um, and on our April 1st, we would review the final uh, bid packages and sign a final contract. The work would un be underway spring and summer of 2025, breaking the ground on the Performing Arts Center. Um, in summer 2025, we'd do the secured entrances at Bethel and the library uh, ventilation. Um, summer 2026, we'd be the PAC, uh, performing arts wing would be finished and um, we would do the fuel switch and propane upgrade then and with everything complete by fall 2026. Um, just to compare what the cost of this bond is compared to um, what previous bonds have cost, uh, when Royalton did the gym bond, that was when we were individual town districts which meant that, you know, we didn't have the combined um, 
power of both of our towns paying for it. And it was also um, back in 2008, and we our tax base has grown since then. So the Royalton Gym Bond was $3.8 million, $8 million, so it was just slightly higher than what we're asking for now, but it was almost four times the tax impact for taxpayers versus what we're projecting this bond would be for our um, for taxpayers now. The Bethel campus had a bond in 2012 for $500,000 for a 10-year bond, and that um, the tax impact for that was just slightly lower than what we're projecting for this bond. So, you know, when we say that this bond is affordable, one of the reasons why we can say that is we've already been paying for bonds at the level that we're looking to be paying going forward. Um, but we will have an overlap of a couple of years on payments for the gym bond and the proposed bond. And, but even while we're paying for both bonds, the first year that we are paying the, in FY26, we'd be paying less in total bond payments than we did in FY23, that was you know, two years ago. And um, when principal payments start, and that's gonna be the maximum amount that the bond is going to, the combined bonds affect our, our budget, it's going to be less than what we were paying, or less, than, less of a tax impact than what the bonds were in FY21. So our towns have shown that they can afford this, uh, the overall tax cost to taxpayers is affordable, as we've shown. So, um, yeah, and we're it's going. This project is going to provide a lot of really great things for our students in our community. So uh, it's really important that everybody gets out and votes, um, and you can decide which way is the easiest way to vote for you. Um, you can vote in person on November 5th between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. Bethel residents will vote on the Bethel School campus and Royalton residents will vote on the Royalton campus and the elementary gym. Um, you can request an absentee ballot and have that mailed to you um, if you call your town clerk or email your town clerk. The ballots do need to be received by the town clerk by the close of business on November 4th, so make sure that you mail back your ballots with plenty of time for delivery to happen by then. You can also drop off your absentee ballots anytime at, um, before uh, election day at your town clerk's office, or you can drop <coughs> off the absentee ballots at your polling place on election day if you want to make sure that they arrive in time. You can vote early by just stopping by your town clerk's office and filling out the form right there and giving it right back, or filling out the ballot right there and giving it right back. Or for people who have um, are housebound or ill, they can call the town clerk to arrange um, for in-home ballot delivery. In that case, two justices of the peace will come on election day and bring a ballot to you to fill out um, to for your vote. Um, and the Contact information for the Bethel Town Clerk and the Royalton Town Clerk are there, so if anybody needs that, you know, feel free to speak up and get it. Um, okay. So uh, thanks everybody again for coming out, and thank you for your continued support of our school. We do have a website which has a lot more information as well. So at this point, why don't we do some questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. So, I'm just saving your name for... Oh, Mary Pavoni yeah. <clears throat> from Bethel. So the first question is, um, if you or someone here has that figure at hand, the what you're using, because it's easier to convey, and for anybody to remember, is to say for the $200,000 average home value, it's going to be $50 uh, average <laughs> over the 20-year bond. Okay. What is it really going to be at the highest point? What, what would be the real figure uh, in year three when we're starting to pay the principal? Sure. I, I would need to double check. Rough, it. just a rough. Yeah. yeah. We do have on the website, There's a you can look at like every year what it would be. I think it's around $70 at that max. $7? 70 Oh, 70 OK. So it's only between 50 and 70 that well, it's, so it's, it's peaking, it's, and then it's, it's between like 
30, 25, like at, at the beginning, I think it's 30, and then it goes up to 70, and then it's down to 20 by the end. Uh -huh. so okay. It's something along that line. So okay. It's, you know. My second question, I think somebody from Bethel probably knows this more, but if any of you know, what um, what bonds are people in Bethel still paying off right now? Are we paying off the town hall? Are we paying off the, the big water improvement that we just voted in a couple of years ago? How many bond votes do we have stacked up? Because because that last nice little slide did that, I don't think represents yeah, that Bethel. Was, that was just the school district. Yeah, yeah. we do Future. still have the town. Hall bond, and we do have the water. Are those the only two? Uh, I can't speak to that for sure, but those are two that I can confirm, yes. Yeah. So one thing I would point out with that is the town bonds and the school district bonds are much different as far as their tax impact. So if you get, you know, I know, um, I don't, I haven't done the math for the exact you know, difference, but if you get a $1 million town bond, that's going to have much higher tax impact than a $1 million school bond. Because the school bond we're paying for, the two towns um, are paying for it, plus we're um, getting money from the Ed Fund. So the amount that's of money we Ed send fund. for taxes, we get a lot more money back from the Ed Fund than we send for... You mean the state? state yes, yeah, state funding source, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I'll try and do the math on that at some point, but I my Suspicion, you know, we at Royalton we just approved a one million dollar bond for road construction, and my guess is that that would have a higher tax impact than our three million dollar bond that we're proposing now. So, I, and I, yeah, I and, and I'm and I'm not so. trying to 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 yeah. integrate this project. I'm just thinking about the reality of how many things that we have stacked up in Bethel that do have a big tax implication. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no idea how many years more we have to pay on them. Is the 2012 bond the school one? Yeah, that's all paid off. Ten now. years is done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the ten year bond. Yeah. Um, that one expired just a couple years ago. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Allie Griffin, and when you say that we have a 10% increase of students, is that from Rochester because they don't have a high school? Um, I mean, I think we have a few classes that are large just in, in our uh -huh. school itself, but we've also have been getting a lot more tools. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would say that a, a big chunk of our growth, if you look, is be, it's at the middle high school level it, uh -huh. it, it, around tuition students. Uh -huh. And it's a combination of first branch, which is Chelsea Tumbridge. Uh -huh. So Chelsea Tumbridge is sending you about 30 High school students right now okay. um, and then you did just get 85% of the Rochester Stockbridge seventh graders that are now <coughs> at your middle school mm -hmm. so we are certainly seeing increases in regards to tuition students choosing your district so and that, that and you think that will continue that we can yeah I think we, we've got a good project uh, product and that's what we've been seeing so if you look at the enrollment yeah. A big chunk of that is tuition enrollment, mm -hmm. and um, we've, we're seeing that build. We haven't. We it's continued to grow. It hasn't like peaked and then dropped down yeah. in the last five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I've been talking to a lot of different people, and they have. So I'm not. These aren't all my questions, but um, the security, the 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 security piece. Okay, so some people are concerned that when organizations are at the high school, that people are propping the doors open. Is that going to be, is that because of ventilation or is that going to be more secure if you're doing these secure entrances? Um, I mean, I think generally that's happening after hours. Like, you really want to secure the school entrances oh, during, during school, school. hours. Okay. Um, but okay. I think that we hopefully the system will provide easier key card access so that you know we can so, so. provide you know the ability for organizations to lock unlock and lock the doors as they need to. As they need. Um, yeah. Um, and so the and then. 
this company that you've gotten? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so one thing I would say about that is we have already done um, a first phase of the project that's mentioned in the flyer there, okay. um, where they did the conversion of this Bethel campus from mm -hmm. um, the steam heat to uh, wood pellet uh, system, oh, okay. and had also LED upgrades and the lighting and other improvements. And so that was two point two million dollars worth of work that they did, and. and mm -hmm. Those projects were completed on time and on budget, and so. Okay, you know, and 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 you, you were really good about no waste or doing stuff and then having to change it because of wasteful stuff or anything. We're we're trying to build long term like uh -huh. outlooks at the school, so really anything that we do is with a long term idea with it. So um, we're trying to minimize any waste and making sure any improvements that we do are. 20, 30 year improvements that are going to last a long time. And you don't have to change. I think the other thing that I appreciate is they're conservative with their estimates too. You know, like mm -hmm. a lot of those cost estimates, like mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that we're not going to go over budget on this. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're good about making sure that they <coughs> are providing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to next year. Well, I just kind of come. I, I'm not sure, Ellie, if you're aware of how valuable the tuition students are to us. I, I was surprised yeah. how high the tuition rate. It's nineteen thousand nine hundred dollars a town pays to send a student to us each year. Mm -hmm. So, I actually my compliments on your presentation, but I actually think your your estimates of incoming tuition students are probably very conservative with with mm -hmm. one and two students. If you if you get to, there's eight towns that tuition into us now. If we had one additional student, just one additional student from each town, that's about $160,000 in year one. $320,000 in year two. By year three, when we're starting to pay off the, the principal portion of the bond, you could be up to a half a million dollars more a year and making money on this. So I, I applaud you. I think the key, to, the key to running a school economically is fill up the empty seats. That's your cheapest way to do it. And that's your lowest cost per pupil. That's when your taxes are lowest. So. I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Run it like a business, attracting tuition students, because the downside to saying no to a bond like this is you still have to run your school anyway. And if you don't attract the tuition students, we gotta pay for it all ourselves, and we have no, tu we have no tax relief in sight. So mm -hmm. it seems to me just to make sense for us to be the go-to school and be as good as we can be. Yeah. I'd also like to speak to the fact that I have a lot of uh, tuition students in my classes, and they're all glad they came to South Rosen. Cool. They don't, there's nobody who said, I wish I had um, Yeah, you know, with, I think one of the things that, like the first couple of years of the merger, we wound up with <laughs> deficits. And I think part of that was we didn't wind up getting the tuition students we were expecting. Like we overestimated the tuition students mm -hmm. when we were presenting about the merger. And that wound up, you know, hurting us with revenue. But we are now seeing kind of the numbers that we were expecting. It just took a few more years than we were expecting for them to come in. And now we are seeing, you know, we're getting good tuition revenue, and that really helps our district a lot. Um, May I just so, jump in on that point? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. A moment. I want to present you a very concrete example of a fantastic problem to have. Um, we talked about the numbers of students we've brought in just in this last year. Many of them cited the very programs you've been supporting and building. I'm here for the performing arts opportunity. I'm here for the potential of building things with my hands that other schools aren't doing. I'm here for your music program and the fact that I get lessons, the fact that my kid gets lessons. That's a very powerful thing. What it creates here is we have a band room with, when just seventh and eighth grade are together, there are over 50 students in a space smaller than the room we're in now. We can address that problem potentially here with scheduling. How do we break that group up? Um, what minor need changes to that room make it more accommodating to the group. But that problem isn't as solvable when they get to the high school. We're about to send another 30 students next year playing an instrument and another 30 plus after that. Um, again, great problem to have. When I say 30, I think that's a conservative estimate for who will take that up in high school. And if they're already coming here just for the opportunity and the reputation, um, I mean, just imagine what you're building towards. So I appreciate your point. Uh, the investment now, if you're adding the ability to make a major upgrade or add 
an incredibly attractive program or 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 um, it's a wise investment so again thank you for your point plus if you look around at the schools around us they've all got building problems I was at the public hearing for the uh, Commission on Monday night in Randolph and they were bemoaning their multi-million dollar problem the South Hartford has problems the west of us Woodstock's got a almost fully depleted building we're we're relatively lucky I thought there was a lot of risk with Act 46 with both of our towns kind of committing our physical assets to it, joining our forces, but the fact is um, we're in better shape than everybody around us, and by just taking a couple steps forward, I, I think we can become the go-to school in the area, and that's when everybody wins, the taxpayers and the students, so I applaud your efforts. I, I had a question back on the slide about the timeline, and it, uh, it's really addressed to the uh, consultant. Is um, Permitting an issue for timing at all? You didn't, I didn't see anything plugged in for. We, we will have to go through uh, stormwater permitting. Also, but the fire marshal, you're going to need a. Yep, building. yep, we'll have building permits on and the that's project. All, and that's plugged into the time frame? It is. Okay. Yep, yep. So we've looked through Act 250 permit requirements, uh, wastewater. There is going to be five to six months of permitting time if this thing yep. passes. And uh, like I said, in um, November, then we'd be able to essentially move forward with permitting in December and be ready to break ground around May of 2025. One of the nice things with our timeline also is, you know, we have the $2.2 million of reserve funds, which lets us wait to do our bond until, like, we can use that money to start with the project and wait to actually borrow the money that we need until later in the process, which helps us have more secure surety about what the cost winds up being and the other aspects of the project. Great. So, you know, helps save us money as well. Uh, Dietri Feeney, I, I have to say, I came here with some hesitation, wasn't really sure where I was going with my vote. Um, but I will say that I, you know, I was an athlete in school a long time ago, but music was my, music was why I went to school. And I will say that I'm very happy to see that finally the music kids are getting some attention, <laughs> you know, because sports usually dominate. That's what bring the crowds. And I'm just so happy to see that music kids that play the trombone and kids that sing are finally getting a spot. Um, I also, um, so thank you for that. I do have a couple quick questions. Um, you said up to $600,000 in grants. They haven't been secured. That's the key that I heard. Yeah. I'm concerned about that. What is your contingency plan if that $600,000 of grant money does not come through. Um, I think that'll be a question on a lot of people's minds is where where will that $600,000 come from? Um, can, you want to address that before um, I so ask we, my next question? We do have extra money in our building reserve fund and also you know as I said when I was if you take the 1.7 million that we're from the um, building reserve that we we're hoping to use plus the 600,000 plus the 1.3 million plus the 3.8 million that's I forget exactly what it adds up to, but it's more than 6.8. So if we don't get all the building reserve fund, or the, sorry, all the um, grant money, then we have wriggle room there, both in extra reserve funds that we could dedicate to the project, and also just in the amount that we've asked for for the bond. So ideally, all that money comes in, we wind up with like a three point, you know, four million dollar bond instead and we're able to save even more money compared to But you're pretty confident that the grant, we're, you know, um, in a good position to receive it? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I mean, I think it's a strong grant. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. grants can go either way. Then who's the grant with? Who are you applying to? So we've got a grant that we've applied with, with the COPS program in regards to our security concerns. Mm -hmm. And so we will hear about that in March. One of the things that I think I feel hopeful about is that we are a rural school. 
looking to get some funding in this. And it was a pretty comprehensive grant, and so I would tell you I don't think any just school applied, right? And they were looking for schools to apply, so I think that that will serve us fairly well, too. Perfect. Um, what will the basement room that's currently being used for be used for when we have this wonderful performing arts wing? Um, I'll let Jamie speak to it as well, but um, we will then have a dedicated elementary music program, so or music space, so they won't have to take the cart and go into individual classrooms anymore. Like they'll have a dedicated space, they can have all their equipment and stuff set up, and you know not have to call things to different rooms and set it up and unpack and everything. But then there's also some office space and um, lesson room space that would be opened up that um, I'll let James know. Won't, won't that basement room still have the um, current problem, which is not good insulation and noise levels <clears throat> for young kids who would well, be then using it? We're mostly thinking about general music, right? So when you're talking about a high school band, the decimal is much higher than like a general elementary class. I was thinking of drumming classes. I saw the, the list of things going on on, uh, on the bulletin board out here, and I was mm -hmm. dreaming. Yeah, no, we're, we're thinking rising. specific to general music. Okay. I could see our elementary band actually having access to the Performing Arts Center. Okay. Um, but also, um, in regards to those office spaces, as we continue to need to increase mental health supports and wraparound supports for students to best serve them in our schools, um, we're always in need of space for like therapeutic interventionists to be able to work with kids, also academic interventionists, also if we have our school psychologists doing testing with students. Right now, we don't really have confidential space, like they're all sharing those spaces. So to be able to have some dedicated additional office space for them to be able to support kids in, um, they would go to good use in that regard. And then just my last Sometimes question. Sometimes right now it's oh, Andrew's sorry. office. Sometimes it's my office. And then just the last question I have, I was just curious, why propane versus, like you converted to wood pellet here, why propane over another heat source? Uh, part of it was driven by the fuel oil tank that's at end of life that's just outside of the wood chip facility or where the wood shop is, uh, expansion is going to be. And then it's a cleaner burning fuel than oil is. Um, I don't think wood chip long term is necessarily ruled out at the Royalton High School, but there is space concerns right now in just general square footage and the size that a wood chip boiler would take in it. And there is useful life in the equipment. So in doing the analysis, it, it made a lot of sense to get rid of the fuel oil, convert existing boilers to propane. It's a cleaning burning fuel, and it's more readily available now in the state. And we did propane here too. So in oh. your campus here, when we did this, you have a wood chip, but you have a propane backup as well okay. for redundancy. And you don't, we, you know, we will launch the wood chip typically when the heating season really comes like on these anchor seasons, like right now, it's going to get cold, right? We're going to burn propane right now, right. and then come December, we'll flip over to the wood chip. Yeah. And it's, uh, you can also kind of think of it as like a bridge to when that boiler reaches the end of life, and we can do a more, you know, extensive I think we convert these conversion. Boilers. If they want to right now, they have to own the now. Would you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, fundraising effort? Okay, um, yeah, the Music Boosters have been fundraising. They're looking for individual donations, but also have been um, you know, going to large donors. And you know, one of the uh, biggest donations has been $500,000 from the Byrne Foundation, which has you know, a really great um, contribution to the space, but they're actively seeking donations from you know, small donors, but also continuing to look for large donors as well. Um, you know, I'm not, we, we won't know exactly how much has been raised by the time the vote happens, but I think that their fundraising operation is going to continue after that. When we talked about the target being, you know, one third bonds, one third um, reserve funds, and one third fundraising for the performing arts. Um, upgrades, 
the one third is actually less than that $1.3 million goal. So if they are able to reach that $1.3 million goal, there, you know, we can add extra things that are not included in the current proposal. So, you know, that gives motivation for people who are giving money to, you know, they, they can actually provide meaningful upgrades in addition to kind of what we were already proposing. So, you know, hopefully that will continue to motivate donations. There, there's two more large donors that we know of right now that that are, I believe, cl fairly close to making a decision. I mean, I think they've committed some type of funding, but we don't know what the exact funding amount's going to be yet. Mm -hmm. On top of the five, there's two others that we're waiting on. I would just like to say, you know, m my biggest concern, I work for the town of Bethel, and, and I have the unfortunate job of dealing with delinquent taxes, delinquent utilities. I work with a lot of people to build payment agreements and I deal with the tax sales and I have a very unpleasant job in a lot of respects. And um, I field a lot of calls on the regular. Um, people who are just in difficult financial situations and I I have a lot of compassion for them and in this conversation where I appreciate that you've really spelled out the financials and and that it's seemingly affordable um, but we also you know in the ideal world where we aren't looking at inflation and the price of groceries and the price I just I'm, I'm just so concerned right now about um, so, m so many of our residents that are on fixed incomes, uh, where a paycheck is not coming in regularly. Um, I really feel like um, there's going to be a struggle there. And so I just, I, I, you know, I think I'm stating the obvious. Um, and so where this is a phenomenal opportunity and I support it, um, I just worry that a lot of people are going to be making their vote based on the reality of paying more for, you know, a program like, or a project like this, or keeping their home, buying groceries, paying for medications. I just, we're just in a tough spot right now. And I just, I just really worry. I really worry. Yeah, we, we do really take that into consideration anytime that we're putting budgetary stuff out. So, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of as a board is that we have kept our education tax rate that hasn't gone up since, you know, in five years. Like we've kept it level or had a decrease in the last five years. Um, and, you know, if you look at our our budget um, compared to inflation, where our budget's actually expanded less than inflation. When, if you look, if this is you know, I looked up the numbers for the last eight years, our budget's been you know more than a percentage point less than inflation over that time period increase. And if you look at the Ed Fund <coughs> increase, it's it's like two percentage points above inflation. So compared to the rest of the state, we really have done a good job of containing costs and trying to be mindful of taxpayers and, and making sure that we're you know, providing a good educa education but doing it at a reasonable cost for people. And you know, we are trying to do the same with this pro project. You know? I do think it, as you know, the tuition student discussion, you know, I think it is an investment towards, per, you know, I don't know that I don't want to go out on a limb and say that it's going to save us money, but you know I think it's going to provide great benefits, and there's a chance that you know we can do it with very minimal impact for for taxpayers. All right. Um, unless there's other questions people want to ask now, um, I'd suggest that we walk down to the entrance area and we can look at that space and. and talk about what changes would be made down there.
push button on one of these poles outside of our new vestibule area. That would allow ADA access into the catch area. They can then go up to your administrative window that is going to get modified over here. Um, the doors behind them would essentially close, creating that secured entrance. Um, and then from that front desk, um, Janet or the front desk person would be able to buzz in and then unlock the second set of doors down through here. So you have a set of locked doors on the perimeter, people come in, you can see everybody inside the space, and then another buzzer would essentially allow them in. And all that would be incorporated, we talked about um, adding new badge access controls to not only these exterior doors, but also the doors that lead out to the playground over here and then doing the same thing for the elementary space as well. Any other renovations to the elementary space? Yeah, that's a programming thing, and I can go, if you guys want to go over there, I can kind of show you it. But um, I just want to make one comment about this space. We have another concrete example of how we intend to use this space happening in, well, just a less than two weeks. Um, if you think about where we set up for voting on election day, Consider the flow through this building. Come in through this entrance, right into that space. Uh, access is secured going down the hallway or potentially out through there. Uh, and you think about, again, our community events. This is the main point of entry for concerts, whether it's elementary or middle school. Uh, so having that double pass filter, having the human being that's right there, as opposed to at a faraway desk looking through a video monitor, all of those things make this one pass filter a bit more secure, more attractive, uh, and safer for our students, more welcoming. So this is kind of the complete package. And what he's talking it about- addresses a lot of hardware. That's it, yeah, it addresses a lot 50, of hardware. 60 years old. Um, things that are not part of the bond that we have been improving right along, the double doors down by the uh, library. We're replacing those beat up old doors. Mm -hmm. This being the 1950 wing, the 1970 parts added on. It's time to replace these things. So regardless of where the bond vote goes, we're still doing those interior improvements. I have two more doors coming in tomorrow for installation. So it's, it's all tied together. Uh, those are just much smaller projects. And you said you wanted to go to the elementary. Well, does anyone have any questions on this entrance over here? Nope. Okay. So as you mentioned here, it's really more of how we use this space that's changing. Yeah. Right? because we already have the pass filter built in of a potential double entrance. Uh, and considering the flow of this space, for the day-to-day uh, -day management, it's about how the students will transition through this space. Um, it's already set up, there are already procedures in place. Elementary students are greeted by a human standing right there every morning. That may continue as we're welcoming students. But what you would not see is we would not see music lessons taking place out here anymore. We'll continue to find spaces for them around the corner. You would not have access to the kindergarten or first grade, depending on the year, right there. We would use the door on the other side, uh, and that door would remain closed. So you have the initial lock with the buzz in, the video camera that Yvonne McKenna, in this case, on the other side of that wall could see. Uh, so you'd have a lock and a lock. And again, in terms of how people transition through this space during the day, you have to be seen by the adult. Uh, you have to know who you are. You're led into this area, and then someone could greet or buzz in from here. That's my understanding. Yeah, so really, my it's a programming. It's a combination of programming and how you use the space. Um, this does become the catch area, essentially, in through here. Um, the nice thing about having the door access control locks with the new badge access swipes is you can set timers to them. So typically, what you'll see is from you know, 7.45 to 8 o'clock or 8.15 in the morning, this door is unlocked to allow the students and parents to come into the space. Um, usually after 8.15, it becomes locked at that point. Um, like Pierre was mentioning, these doors would all be normally closed. So right now you'll see that they're all on essentially mag holders that's tied into the fire alarm system. That's a programming change and then it's essentially a lock set change on all these doors as well to prevent people from being able to get in. Um, but then you'd have the buzz access and it's really going to allow the school to save a lot of money because you're just reusing a lot of the existing infrastructure and then making modifications to the space while still providing that secured entrance. And, and then actually doing the same thing back here on the double doors that lead out into the playground. So that was another area, I think, talking about having teachers having individual badge access. Um, 
preventing teachers from utilizing their own doors to go in and out to the playground. So then you have a central spot where the mud is collected, kids come in and out in the winter time, and they're not tracking it through the classroom, so it's gonna help with the cleanliness inside the classroom and prevent those potential issues of uh, people putting a block in a door, or potentially propping a door open. I mean, that's, you know. Fire marshals hate that. They hate it. And then. Wait, hate's a strong word, sorry. Yeah, so really, um, it's a combination, and then, you know, really looking at the keen the cores and the keying through the building as we upgrade all the, the exterior doors and we redo the locks through there. We're redoing the master key system through here as well. Um, that probably hasn't been done in a lot of years. Um, and then rekeying a lot of the individual doors as well for kind of uh, occupant safety to the space. So trying to use as much existing infrastructure as we can while trying to accomplish the goals of the secured entrances. Uh, does anybody have any more questions that they want to address? I mean, they, we can be done from here, probably. Uh, nobody else has any questions. Well, thank you very much for coming out, and you know, I, I encourage you to talk to your neighbors and you know, spread the word. We really like as many people to know as much as possible about this. And so, you know, check out the website, talk to your neighbors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys for coming out and for your support.